Well, one of the big stories in retail recently was the dissolution of Bed Bath & Beyond, obviously a retailer that was well known for its uh, locations across the country. But the merger that took place with Bed Bath & Beyond and Overstock.com has brought forward a new company, one that will be focused a lot on e-commerce. Pleasure to be joined by Jonathan Johnson, who is the CEO of that new Bed Bath & Beyond. Jonathan, great to have you with us today. Thanks for a few moments. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, Dan. Thank you. All right. So congratulations. And uh, you've been going at this now for a few weeks. How's everything going with the with the new operations? You know, so far, we're really encouraged. We went uh, live in Canada about a month and a half ago, kind of doing a test up there because our business is much smaller. Uh, so far, uh, there's more direct traffic to the site. Our return on ad spend for our search engine marketing is up. And once customers are on the site, they're converting at a higher rate, which means they're buying more product. We've only been live in the US for about 10 days, uh, but we've seen nice initial results. Take us through that, that decision to start up in Canada. What was, beside, what was behind that? Well, there were two things, primarily, uh, we wanted to launch and use it kind of as a beta test, see what wrinkles there were as we switched from one brand to the other. A lot of technological effort went into that, wanted to make sure we hadn't made any mistakes. Uh, the second was uh, when we purchased the name and the other intellectual property out of bankruptcy, uh, one of the conditions was that in the States, they had another month or so, uh, the trustee wanted to run the stores, uh, their sales in the stores for a month. And we did not want any confusion between in-store experience, which we weren't controlling, meaning brick and mortar experience, and the website experience, which would be the future of the new Bed Bath & Beyond. So the decision to go more so with the Bed Bath & Beyond brand over the Overstock brand, take us into what went behind that. You know, when Overstock started 24 years ago, we were a liquidator and the name described what we did. But for over two decades, we have not been a liquidator. We were first a general retailer and over the last two to three years, we've become focused on home furnishings and furniture. We're really a home company. And yet our name <clears throat> was creating headwind for us. Customers viewed us as a liquidator, no matter how much we tried to associate our name with home. Suppliers viewed us as a liquidator. So we've long looked for a brand that was synonymous with home. We've liked Bed Bath & Beyond for some years. We've kind of looked at it. We like its brand. We like its customer base. We did not like its business model that was had a lot of debt. Um, and we didn't like the brick and mortar aspect. We're an online retailer. So when the things we liked about it, the customers, the intellectual property, and the brand became available in bankruptcy without our having to purchase the things we didn't like, it just seemed like a natural fit in the right time to do a significant rebranding for the company. So how much will the Overstock logo and name still end up being part of the business? And I say that because I wasn't sure until I went on my smartphone and pulled up my Bed Bath & Beyond app and you still had the Overstock logo on there. Yeah, the logo is on there kind of in the lower left-hand corner on the app. It is on the website, not very prominently, but there. During this initial transition period, we want our legacy Overstock customers to know they found the right place as they type in overstock.com and get redirected to the Bed Bath and Beyond.com site. We want them to know they're at the right place. We do intend relatively quickly to sunset the Overstock logo and name some point in the relatively near future, we'll change the name of the company from Overstock to something else. We are becoming Bed Bath & Beyond. We think it's a well-known, well-trusted name 
that's synonymous with what we do. And so we want to get there quickly without alienating our loyal, what I'll call legacy overstock customers as we transition them to the new Bed Bath & Beyond customer. Are, are there components of the Bed Bath & Beyond business that, that still are, are viable and you think are, are, will be beneficial to bring into the operations now as the new company? No question. You know, Bed Bath & Beyond had a lot of things so that we liked. One, we'll get deeper in our product offerings in bed, kitchen, and bath products. We'll also expand the name brand products that, uh, that, that Bed Bath & Beyond and Overstock customers want. And then there are things that Bed Bath has historically done well, like registries that Overstock has not done well, that we will incorporate. You know, I was self-aware enough as the CEO of Overstock to know that no one, not even my own children, would put registered at overstock.com on their wedding invitations. <laughs> but we see registered at Bed Bath & Beyond all the time. So you can expect our registries business to do better. Bed Bath was also very good at significant life events, whether that was weddings or births or moving off to school or into your first apartment, they had a very good back to dorm inner apartment business that we can think we can capitalize on. How has this process impacted your thought process about being the CEO of the company? Has anything changed or tweaked along the way? Well, I hope things are always changing. You know, one of Overstock's qualities that we try and uh, nurture is becoming. We want the company, our teams, and each individual to become better. Uh, part of what I think it's ch changed for me is just the focus on getting more name brands on the site, uh, the focus on reaching out to suppliers who historically haven't been willing to do business or at least offer their full catalog of business to overstock, but now we're willing to offer that to Bed Bath & Beyond. It's also created a real level of excitement within the company. You know, for years, we would have company-wide stand-ups and invariably someone would ask, when are we gonna change our name away from Overstock? I think this shows, <laughs> excuse me, that waiting for the right time and being patient, uh, you can find a, Often you can find a solution that didn't appear feasible at one point, but then does become feasible. So it's, 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 I think trying to augment the excitement, which is in the company and make sure that doesn't dissipate as the deal gets further away, but continues to grow uh, as we encourage new customers to come to the site. I think what we've all gone through over the last three to four years has been just obviously it's been a very hard time, but I think it's also been a unique one to be able to learn from. As you look back at that time, how have you viewed what has played out for you and for Overstock and to a degree, I guess, for Bed Bath & Beyond as well uh, during the time of the pandemic? Yeah, you know, uh, I became CEO at Overstock uh, about six, eight months before the pandemic began. And Overstock was really in a tough, financial position and uh, we worked to bolster that. But the pandemic was good for our business. We were home and home furnishings and people were stuck at home and we were online and people couldn't shop brick and mortar. So it was very good for our business, but hard for our employees. And as much as I was a chief executive officer during the height of the pandemic, I was just as much what I would sometimes refer to as kind of a chief pastoral officer. There was a calming, trying to over communicate uh, and, and you know, talk about personal concerns that employees might be having and the pandemic was a scary time. Post pandemic, uh, I would say our industry, the home furnishings industry, the home products industry has been in a recession and while while uh, the general economy may have avoided a recession and we may see a soft landing, 
Um, as people got back to purchasing services and experiential things, this business was in a recession. And so it was really important for us at Overstock to make sure that we minded the bottom line. And we just recorded our 13th consecutive quarter of positive adjusted EBITDA. Minding our balance sheet and keeping it strong and healthy allowed us to play offense in what's really kind of a defensive time for the industry, make this acquisition of the Bed Bath & Beyond brand and other intellectual property, and have the wherewithal to market in a more meaningful way during this rebrand. We will, and you know, we've let the street know, we're going to deviate on purpose for a short time of watching the bottom line so that we can grow the top line. We think it's a unique opportunity to, to find customers and bring them to the new Bed Bath & Beyond that won't exist. You know, that opportunity won't exist forever. So it's good to have a balance sheet that lets us work on that now. Well, I, I think there's something to be said, especially in, in your sector, about the name of the products that you're bringing in, the trust that a lot of consumers have in those names as you move forward. Yeah, and, you know, we, we have found in these early days of the transition that, as I mentioned, our return on ad spend for search engine marketing is up. And I think that's because when someone's searching for linens, on Google or elsewhere online, and they see a bed bath search result come up, it's a name they know and trust, and they know they're gonna get a name brand quality product. When they used to see an overstock product shop pop up, we had to convince them that it wasn't liquidation, that it wasn't last year's goods. And so I think having a solid brand as a retailer and adding to that, name brand products, uh, you know, the Calphalon, uh, the, the Keurigs, the Cuisinarts, uh, that's what customers want. And I think one of the things that Bed Bath ran into trouble before bankruptcy was moving away from name brands into private label. And my view is that retailers should be meeting customer demands, not trying to change customer wants. And I think that's what the old Bed Bath kind of ran into that problem. We intend to solve problems for our customers, give them what they want at prices that they just love. So Bed Bath & Beyond really, I think, if you look at the company before the, the, uh, the merger, I think it's safe to say that people would view it as a, a company that was based on retail, more so you know, the bricks and mortar, more so than e-commerce. How then now do you take that customer base that uh, of Bed Bath & Beyond that knew it as bricks and mortar and bring them into the fold with the new company uh, with the combined element with Overstock? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And we did a fair amount of research on that before uh, you know, engaging in this transaction. Bed Bath's business online was significant. It was over a billion dollars in the trailing 12 months. And so there are customers that went there digitally. I think the pandemic also got <clears throat> most consumers more comfortable shopping online for furniture and home goods than they had been in the past. And that penetration from brick and mortar to online continues to grow. I think for us, the trick will be reaching out to that Bed Bath & Beyond customer who loved the big blue coupon. You know, if, if your kitchen is like mine and has what we affectionately refer to as a junk drawer, uh, in that drawer, there will be likely uh, that big blue coupon that showed up in the mail. Uh, for us, it will be convincing uh, customers to download the Bed Bath & Beyond app. That will be the best way for them to find. If you love the coupon before, you'll love the app today because that's where the best deals, the best offers will continue to come. And, and it wasn't just a coupon. It was several coupons. So how do you, you, do you, I mean, is there a point down the road potentially where the actual idea of the coupon goes away or do you kind of keep that in the mix? Maybe not as as prevalent or as, you know, as, as common as it was with the old company. Yeah. So 
The old Bed Bath & Beyond was a high-low retailer. Its highs were a little high, and thus it had you know, a large percentage off coupon. Uh, Overstock has always been a high-low retailer, offering site sales and coupons, but our prices are sharper. And so our coupons aren't quite as large. And I think what historic Bed Bath customers, Welcome Rewards customers will see is they'll still have great deals through site sales and coupons. The coupons may not be as big, but the prices, because they're sharper, will be better than they were before. And I think ultimately that's what the customer wants. They want the best price. They do like a call to action and a site sale or a coupon or another promotion is a call to action. And we try and really balance sharp pricing without being an everyday low price leader, being in this high low retailer with the right promotions as a call to action. Let me finish up with this because it, it, you've mentioned it a couple of times. But the element of brand uh, is really kind of key to this entire process. And I think it, it, it feels like, correct me if I'm wrong, that I've had more companies, I've seen more companies talk about their brand more so in the last five years than maybe we saw going back a couple of days, uh, decades. Do you see that as well? I, I do. And I think we see it two ways. So Overstock has always had a very good business model, one that knows how to run an asset like business and make money. But we had this anchor of a brand that didn't accurately describe who we had become. Bed Bath & Beyond had a well-known, well-trusted, I would even say iconic brand, but with a business model that over time had become its boat anchor. And, you know, it had heard a lot of debt. What we've done is we've ridded each of their anchors. We're taking a, a solid business model that Overstock's had, attaching it to this well-known, well-trusted brand. And we think that's a boat, to keep this metaphor going, that can sail sleekly, anchor-free uh, into the future. And so I think guarding that brand, nurturing that Bed Bath & Beyond brand, and attaching it to our, what we think is a better business model, really takes us into a bigger, better beyond than we've had before. Jonathan, great to talk with you. Thanks for giving us a few moments. All the best as you continue to roll things out and we will uh, catch up with you again down the road. Let's do it again, Dan. Thanks so much. You got it. Jonathan Johnson, who is the CEO of Bed Bath & Beyond. That was great. Thank you very much for doing that. Greatly appreciate it. Dan, you're easy to talk to. I felt like it was two friends talking over lunch, not being interviewed by a reporter. That was awesome. You know, that I, I've had uh, executives tell me that, and that goes to my background uh, because before I got into business, uh, I was in baseball. And oh. I, was, I, I broadcast minor league baseball for 13 years. And so in that job, you have to be a storyteller. And so, oh, yeah, I... Oh, see, that's, oh, that's, that's a great collector's item. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I grew up falling asleep on my green transistor radio, listening to the dulcet voice of Vince Scully every night. Yep. And I'm a diehard baseball fan. So I think that probably came through in the interview there. But okay. when you were asking questions, it just felt natural. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, and so let's do this again uh, at some point down the road um, because, uh, and it's funny why I asked you again about brand is um, I had done an interview with the CEO of uh, the company that oversees the daytime Emmy awards yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I talked to him about brand. And, and I think what we want to try and do in the next couple of months is do a special on how companies think about brand right now and thinking about it in the wake of the pandemic and where they're moving forward. So thank you for well, doing it. You know, in a couple of months, we'll have, we'll have more data and, you know, kind of, I think our story, I hope it's very interesting then. Well, let's circle back then. And, and Kirsty, you can kind of maybe loosely put that on your calendar that Michelle or Sam will be in touch with you uh, to see if we can have Jonathan back on in a couple of months to do, an interview about brand. Last question, Dan, are you a Phillies fan? And did you 
Absolutely. Did you get excited by that no hitter we saw. That was phenomenal. And, you know, you've probably heard the stories that it was only his second start since he got traded. It was his first start at home in Philadelphia. So that was a great way to introduce himself to the Philly marketplace. I read the article in the Wall Street Journal about his special shoes where he's converted his skater yeah. vans into cleats. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think he might be the only major leaguer that has a set of vans cleats that uh, he was on the field. And now he had to send them to the Hall of Fame. So he's got to get a new pair all set. That's awesome. Yeah. Have a great jo weekend. Thanks, Jonathan. Great to talk to you. Kirsty, thanks again. We will stay in touch. Nice all right.